Amen. Well, good morning. Great to be here. I forgot to, uh, to grab a music stand, so one second. Uh, Merry Christmas. And uh, it's fun. Um, well, there's the slide. We're going to be talking about uh, home alone or not being home alone. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to know, uh, you know, because I feel like many people who have December birthdays kind of get the short end of the stick here uh, in being celebrated. And uh, we've got some very special guests all the way from New Zealand, from Auckland. Where they're, oh, there they are. So stand up, Peter and Callie. So Callie grew up in the church here. And uh, this is her, her new husband. They got married a, about a year ago. But it was Peter's birthday yesterday. So if you have a December birthday, stand up. If you are not, if you are so inclined, because we're going to sing you happy birthday, because I don't want you to feel left out. I don't want you to feel unspecial, and uh, I want you to feel extra loved by the church here. So if you're online, you got to sing with us too. So happy birthday to you. Woo! Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear y'all. Happy birthday to you. Hey, all right. I know that that does not make up for getting the double gift and uh, being forgotten and all the other stuff, right? But uh, hopefully that does help a little bit. And we do want you to feel extra special. And if you go... My birthday's in July. I want you to feel extra special being here, too. Uh, we are very grateful for each and every one of you. You know, as you're, as you're getting close to Christmas here, lots of different traditions, lots of things that are fun, lots of things that are weird, uh, right? But I was thinking about one fun one is some different movies that you get to watch. And I was thinking of, like, there's some families that they have to watch some different movies. So kind of by round of applause here if you, if you have to watch Elf. Elf's a good one. I have to quote like most of the movie throughout. It annoys my children. Um, but then I was thinking about like my family, we had to watch It's a Wonderful Life. But we had to watch It's a Wonderful Life in black and white because the colorized version was an abomination to the Lord, according to my mother. Um, Miracle on 34th Street. Okay. The Grinch. Okay, okay, okay. But the old version Grinch or the new version Grinch? Wow, that was resounding. Um, then I was thinking, Home Alone, right? You know, like, and obviously the first one is the best, for sure, right? But, you know, if you don't know, I don't know what rock you've been under, but uh, 1990s movie, um, classic comedy, Kevin McAllister, uh, is the, the, the lead character. He is uh, kind of a really snot-nosed kid uh, who accidentally gets left behind as his parents go on vacation right after he had wished that they would all disappear, right? And, but then he, you know, he realizes, like, oh, maybe this isn't so much fun, and these two burglars that are just the dumbest ever, Harv and, uh, Harv, Marv and Harry, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to plan to rob the house, and then all the, you know, little booby traps that he makes and stuff like that. So, ends up finding himself very lonely, missing the family that he thought he wanted to, to disappear. He's so, he's like, I'm alone, but I don't want to be alone. As I got to thinking about this, is there times where you go, have I, have you, maybe you've felt lonely? And I think all of us at some point, in some way, shape, or form, feel lonely. And even when you're surrounded by people, it's really easy to feel lonely. And I think it's, it's, it's unfortunate and it's complicated right now in our world, especially with social media, where you're like, I have access to everybody on the planet almost, and yet I can feel totally alone. And I think it, it also gets compounded during the holidays. Because, man, if you feel alone on a normal day, and then Thanksgiving, and everybody's posting pictures of family that they, they like, or at least on social me media pretend to like, um, that you, it, it can compound that. And as you start getting towards Christmas, and then you go, man... The, the snowy weather or the, the lack of sunlight or daylight savings time that's like the worst thing ever, right? You know, and the shortest days and we start to get more and more um, discouraged or depressed in that. And, uh, you know, I'm excited for our Christmas Eve potluck. 
If you get on the website, there's an uh, RSVP for that. If you want to come after our evening candlelight service, we're going to do a Christmas Eve potluck. And we started doing this last year, and it was just such a great time of people who don't have family nearby or don't have, you know, or maybe they're, it's not their turn with the kids. And so they're alone when everybody else is celebrating. Or maybe there's people that have passed away and you just don't have somebody to be there. It was a wonderful time of just being able to be there and invite you to come to that, especially if you're feeling lonely. You know, and I was thinking about the first... Uh, Christmas, um, and the fact that there was, you know, a, a very, very, a couple that was feeling very similar in some of that, I'm guessing, feeling lonely, and uh, all kinds of things that happened in there, and so I want to look at a few events that the title is today, Not Home Alone, uh, because, you know, I don't want you to feel like you're home alone, but, but I want to look at a few events in this, in their story that I think are kind of neat to go through and see this idea there that even though they may felt alone, they were not alone. And uh, I want you to start by thinking about Mary. In, uh, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, it says this. It says, The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be fulfilled. Uh, may your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. You know, so we, we know the story, most of us, right? That Mary's engaged to, to Joseph, and they're in their, their life here together, and this angel comes to visit her. And I am totally amazed by her faith and her obedience, because it's like immediate. And maybe there's a big, long gap in there, but doesn't appear to be. And there is zero questions asked, because if it's me... I'm going to have some questions, <laughs> right? Like, uh, wait a minute. And I just, I go, I don't know. And I don't know what was going on that for the, with her, but I also probably imagine the very next morning where she wakes up and goes, what did I just do, <laughs> right? Like that idea of like, wait a minute, now all this and maybe the excitement of that and starts thinking about it. We know from Matthew's account that she didn't run until Joseph. He found out later but it wasn't appearing that she told anybody, that she kept it to herself. And wouldn't you have done the same? Because maybe in the excitement and in your faith and going, yeah, I'm totally going to do this. But I'm definitely not telling anybody. Because all of the questions, and I have zero answers because I didn't ask any questions, <laughs> right? And, and I go, it, it's tough when we have something so huge in our lives. And then we go, I have to keep this secret. You ever had that where somebody goes, hey, I'm going to tell you something, but I can't, you can't tell anybody. I have learned over many years in the ministry of go, I, I can't make that promise without knowing what it is you're going to tell me. I promise I'm not going to tell people who don't need to know, but I can't keep that because I have learned the, the, the cost of that emotionally and spiritually in my heart too because I go, it's not a healthy thing all the time to keep stuff in. But for her, she's trying to keep this to herself. She's trying to go, what is this going to mean? And talk about lonely when you're trying to hide something like this or keep it to yourself. I think Joseph probably endured some loneliness too, loneliness as well. We read in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. But Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what was conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, can you imagine how Joseph must have felt when he first learned that Mary was pregnant? I mean, at some point, it's pretty obvious, right? We've got some pregnant mamas, and you go... Are they? Are they not? And, you know, I have learned unless I see a baby, like, physically, I don't say anything anymore, right? <laughs> but when people have announced it and they got the cute pooch, and you're like, oh, wow. I don't think this is probably how Joseph felt. Like, wait a minute, what's happening right now, right? And, and there's very different feelings going on this. She's going to have a baby. Of this, he's absolutely certain it's not his. And I go, you, to really get that feeling in the situation, you got to understand the critical nature in which the, the culture at the time, kind of how they viewed all of this. 
because dating was not like it was now. Their dating marriage, none of that is, relates to how we do it today. People didn't go to high school or college together, meet, fall in love, and then decide to get married, right? It was very much uh, a, a business decision. Oftentimes, the marriage was not the decision of the woman at all. And it was simply part of a business or a family decision made by her father. And so the first step in this arranged marriage was called the betrothal. So the suitor would approach the father and say, hey, kind of interested, often through a third party, kind of that matchmaker. And a, a pact would be made, a dowry of the woman was set, and the arrangements for the groom and the marriage arrangements were established. And with Joseph and Mary, the arrangements had been made, but the actual wedding hadn't taken place yet. So they were betrothed, they were engaged, sort of, uh, and the betrothal period typically lasted six months to a year. And during this time, the groom would build a home, and the bride could come and visit and have input on, you know, where the cabinets are supposed to go and all that, right? Because that's important. And, uh, you know, while little is said about Joseph, you can imagine that his heart must have been broken. Because... He, he's in here, and he's engaged in this, and he's moving towards that, and then he learns that, that she's pregnant, and it's clear proof that she's been unfaithful, and he's broken, she's broken the trust, and, you know, Joseph's worried about the gossip, and Nazareth is a small town. Uh, information travels really fast in a small town. Like, I grew up in a small town, 24 people in my graduating class, like, small town, like, everybody knows everybody's stuff. It's hard to get away with anything and not have somebody find out, right? And, um, you know, hard to hide things. And some things never change, right? You know, this happened there, that happens now. And Joseph had to come up with this course of action for this situation because he's like, I can't just leave this. And so a righteous man has two choices in this situation. But getting married was probably not one of them. And so he could accuse option A, accuse her of adultery and let her face the consequences. And... Um, I can't imagine the, the loneliness, the abandonment, the betrayal that he's feeling in all of this and all of the uncomfortability that came, came there. And I, so he could accuse Mary publicly and the case of, for divorce would be granted for sure, uh, but, but it would be very, very a substantial cost to Mary because if the woman's found guilty, they typically stoned her to death. So the accusation would be made before the city elders. They would take and have a discussion, have a trial, quote-unquote. And if the decision was made that she was unfaithful, they would immediately carry out the sentence. And the first throne, stone got the privilege of the offended, got to have the privilege of casting that first stone. So Joseph would have had to throw the first stone to have her killed. And then the rest of the village would throw stones at her until she was dead. So go pretty severe consequences for just the accusation of divorce. So the op then option B would be divorce her quietly and just be done with it. And in this case, the divorce would also be granted, but no reason would be given. He would just say, I just want a divorce. No public accusation. And um, there would be humiliation and talk and all of this that would go on there. And it's at this point when it looks like if Joseph you know, is all alone, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to divorce her quietly that God steps in and brings kind of option C and in, in this. And so he's in this quandary and the law that he has really striven to live his life by as a good and righteous man demands him to do something, right? But Joseph, because of his love for Mary, he decides to be merciful. He was going to divorce her quietly. And at this point, if a man wanted to divorce, all he had to do is asked for the divorce, and it was granted. So he could have done that. Not a healthy policy, not a good uh, environment to be a woman in, right? And so he's going to divorce her quietly, and God steps in and gives her this third option. And, you know, imagine the option of marrying Jesus, and, or marrying, ma marrying Mary, and being the father of Jesus, just kind of sealing his, his fate in the culture, going... Everybody's going to know. Small town, everybody's going to know that she was pregnant. And this angel appears to him in this dream, says, hey, fear not, take Mary as your wife. And he goes, okay. And again, immediate response, okay. I'm like, good grief, I'd have questions. <laughs> and God tells Joseph to break the rules of being a righteous person. Isn't that interesting? 
right? Like you go, no, 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 no. A righteous person would follow the law and the law says, and he goes, no, 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 forget all about that. This is way more important. The person is more important. And so he's going to marry this pregnant woman. And God has been there this whole time, and he's providing this much-needed guidance. And God didn't abandon Joseph in loneliness or in the stressful time of his life, and he won't abandon us either. He promises us that. One of my very favorite scriptures is in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, which God pr promises to be faithful and trustworthy, that he'll never leave us helpless without hope. Never. It says in verse 3, it says, But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Have you ever felt abandoned? Have you ever felt betrayed? Have you felt the sting of divorce? Have you felt the slap of rejection? The pit of despair that comes from realizing you're not loved by someone that you've given your heart to? Or where you go, man, I, I poured out and this person, man, they left the church or they hurt me or they said something horrible about, about me on social media. And you go, ooh, I feel totally alone. And God will never turn away from you. You're never alone. And he sent us his son to prove to that to us. And I go, in all of that, in all of those times where Mary's feeling alone, Joseph is feeling alone, God is there. And then I think the second event we're going to look at is, is Jesus' birth. As Joseph and Mary travel towards Bethlehem, you can only imagine the intense pressure that both of, the, both of them must have been under. There was financial pressure of making this trip. Travel had never been cheap, uh, and it never has been, never will be, Right? But there's pressures to act, um, uh, uh, act in, the in, in the act of travel itself, right? Where you're going, man, all these people are doing it. There's not like interstate highways. There's no Motel 6. So even as they're traveling, there's the, the, the threat of thieves attacking you. Um, there's, it's slower because trying to take a pregnant woman probably isn't is super easy. There's the food, the cooking, the sanitation, the fresh water for the animals, somewhere to put everybody up. And ultimately, typically, it was like one to three miles they could travel per day. So I go, this is going to take a little while. So when Joseph then had to provide for Mary and the new baby once it arrived, and becoming a, a father is a daunting task for a guy, too. And obviously, the woman does all the hard work, right? But, but I go, there's, the, there's a sense of responsibility that this baby's just depending on them. And then being thrust in this, into this position can be a lonely experience because they also can't explain to everybody, well, here's what happened, right? And then all of this stress, and then, then I thought about the added stress of being the surrogate father to, the, to God, God's son, right? And you're like, huh, how's that going to work, right? Like, and you're thinking, do I, get, do I have to discipline this kid? Like, it, what is that going to look like? Is he going to, like, come out of the womb, like, speaking scripture and... You know, and I just go, all of those things, I would, like I said, I'd have questions. And, but it'd be just so hard to wrap your head around. But for Joseph, it's this reality. And Joseph's given this task of not only providing for Jesus' well-being, but raising him, teaching him, and, and calling him son. Go, oh, but he's not his son. And I go, I'm quite certain that there was an incredible sense of, of loneliness for Joseph, incredible sense of loneliness for Mary, as she's trying to figure this out. And they're alone in this stable. Jesus is in a manger, wrapped in swaddling co clothing, and they're going, what are we going to do? I'm sure they felt alone. But what's interesting is I want, to, I want you to take note of something here. It says in this scripture, um, where it says in... Um, that you're to give him the name Jesus. So as he's talking, the angel's talking to Joseph, he says, give him the name Jesus. And what was happening to Mary wasn't just happening to her alone, it's happening to Joseph as well, right? By making it clear that Joseph had to give him a name, he has a role in this. And in Jewish tradition, a really crucial role. Because if a father named the child, he's taking ownership of that child and saying, this is my kid, I will raise him. And so as, as, as Jesus announced not just to, to Mary, but to Joseph as well. By naming that, that child Jesus, Joseph became the father in the eyes of the Jewish law. And according to the customs of the day, when the father named that child, he's becoming a member of his family, a member of his tribe. And in doing that, in becoming jo Jesus' earthly father, Joseph was officially making him part of the lineage of David as well. And 
of fulfilling those scriptures on that end of things. And it's true today, as it was centuries ago, that blended families can be a beautiful thing, right? But they also could be tricky from what I've heard. And often they can be lonely, even with this full home and all those different things. And just as G Joseph and Mary weren't alone, we're not alone, regardless of our family status. They were never alone, never. Even when there's this stress and this doubt and the fears of the loneliness of the events that had transp transpired that reinforced the fact that God is watching over them and this little boy that they're having this special child, I'm sure there's still this sense of like, yeah, but. Because we don't worry so much about things that happened in the past. We worry about what's going to happen in the future. You go, well, what, what's this going to mean and how is this going to work and what is this going to look like? And so what does God do? God sends the, the shepherds and the magi and the angels. And, and he goes, you're not alone. I, I'm right here. And not only that, other people are right here. Yeah. So when he's born, the shepherds come the, from the fields to worship him. And the magi come from the east following the star. And the heavenly hosts, it says, fill the night sky and they're singing. And you go, even in the face of this great stress and responsibility, they came to understand that, hey, God's with me. God's with us in this. Joseph was never alone. Mary was never alone. God was with them to help them shoulder this responsibility. And I go, maybe for you, you go, man, I'm carrying this burden of responsibility for somebody else, and I feel totally alone. If you go, I'm trying to be a good parent. I'm trying to be a good roommate. I'm trying to be a, a good son or daughter. I'm trying to love somebody who's sick, and I, I don't know what to do. And, and all of those things that you can just feel burdened as you, you feel burdened for watching somebody or helping them or watching over them. And I think sometimes it, it gets hard because we think I have to do this by myself. But I think God is right there with us. And you have to remember that God is with you and he's walking alongside you and he wants to help you Amen. and he wants to be there. And I think your responsibility, while it's important, is not to carry the burden of shaping someone else to make them like Jesus. Only Jesus can shape them to be like Jesus. See, God is the one who loves unconditionally and shapes the souls of every child, right? And it's the privilege and a joy to help children fall in love with their spiritual father. But you got to trust God and watch and, and understand that he's bringing other people alongside you. Because even though you really care about your child, God cares so much more. God is, is feeling that burden way more than you are. And is he sending wise men? Is he sending shepherds? Is he sending angels to walk alongside with you to say, hey, you're not alone? And maybe you're not seeing it? I guess one of the great advantages of doing life together in church, right? Is you have people to do life with. You have, things, you have people to celebrate the highs. You have people to walk alongside you when you're in lows. And so don't, don't give up on, on looking and trying to see that, hey, God is trying to work. God is trying to help. There are things that are good. Don't just look at the, at the negative. But you've got to trust God and watch him bring the shepherds, the wise men, and the angels to help you. And the last event that I want to look at here deals with the family's escape to Egypt. And in this event, they probably felt alone and lonely. I mean, because you think about the fear that they had there. Fear going to a new place, fear for their lives. And in Matthew chapter 2, if you, if you don't know the story, um, we'll read it here in just a second, but this, this King Herod decides after the Magi come and visit and they go another way home to trick him because he had heard the prophecy as well. So he's like, well, here's the plan. I'll just kill all of the kids and that will make sure that I catch Jesus, uh, this Messiah that is to be, and I don't have to worry about it. And so they have to abandon all they knew and all that they loved in this midnight dash to a completely foreign land with a baby. So Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13 says this. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled that the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. You know, there's no send-off party. There's no opportunity to, like, pack all the stuff that you want to make sure. He has this dream. He wakes up. He says, let's go. He responds immediately. 
What's interesting is so does Mary. She doesn't have the vision, but she's like, okay. And she goes along with this. And I go, the journey to e Egypt was not a short one. They likely had to spend, spend an extended time there. They don't know for how long. And so the two of them in a strange country with no one they know. Imagine what that must have been like. And I go, it, it was certainly an existence unlike anything they'd been bef known before. The sense of alienation that they must have been, been feeling had to have been super profound, right? And when couples lose everything, home, country, security, they often lose each other because they're like, wow, well, let me fight you because there's nobody else to fight. But it could have been that in Egypt, in that time of trial, was where their marriage became more than just two people united in doing God's will of raising this child and keeping him safe. It might have been the time that bonded them together and they relied on each other in this distant land far from their families. You know, so how are you doing in your relationships when things get stressful? Because often when we get stressed out, who do we take it out on? The people that are closest to us. Well, they kind of love me, so I can nuke them, and they have to take it, right? That is not always the case. That is not true. But we often are most unkind to the people we love the most. And so are you relying on God in those times of stress? Are you sitting with Jesus? Are you listening to him? Are you trying to be calmed by his Holy Spirit? Or are you just going, I'm going to take out my frustration on somebody? And often, is it somebody you love the most? Or maybe you go, I just figured it out on my own. I'm just going to try harder. That works really well, doesn't it? Because then you just get angry about everything. But I think this holiday season, as you're feeling stressed, as you're feeling overwhelmed, or you're feeling at odds with relationships that are supposed to bring you joy, what can you do to draw closer to God? Can you find some time to just like slow down and just listen? I love snow. I know some of you are going, oh, shut up, right? <laughs> I love snow. It quiets everything. And, you know, if you're walking through the woods and there's a little bit of snow, it's like it's so quiet. It deadens all the, the noise that's out there. I just love spending time in nature when there's a little bit of snow. Now, too much snow, not a fan. But I go, what can you do this Christmas season to slow down, to listen to God? Say, what, what do you have for me right now? How can, I, how can I rest in you versus going, I just got to do more? But back to Mary and Joseph. Because the Bible talks in several places about us leaving our father and mother and being united to our spouse, kind of that leave and cleave. And I was thinking, this is like a major leave, right? Like you are different country. Um, you know, and I was thinking about when Ann and I first got married, we had so many fun memories together, so many horrible places we lived in, like horrible. Like this one, a, a single brother picked out this apartment, it was a long story of why I did it, and I was like, I can't, exp I cannot believe you thought someone should live here. Like it was horrible. And, uh, you know, it, it was so funny because relationally it was great. But man, we went through a bunch of tough things in the, the first few years, new jobs and losing jobs and companies we were working for went out of business and losing insurance and injuries and sick parents and church conflicts and learning to communicate from growing up in like two entirely different households and being totally opposites, tons of financial difficulties. But we had God and it drew us closer to him in a way that I, like drove me to my knees it was awesome. And it drew, drew us closer to each other. And I imagine Mary and Joseph having some of those same growing pains in the early years of their marriage, where they're like, this is horrible. And they could have fought each other, or they could have allowed it to draw them closer to each other and closer to God. And I think their young marriage, it was resilient. It endured, it looks like. And their love story helps us reflect on the contrasts and the connections between other relationships in the Bible. Because when you think about Adam and Eve, right, it's really different. Because the Old Testament kind of starts with this story of marriage with Adam and Eve, and the New Testament starts with the story of Jesus' uh, Mary and Joseph marriage. And the old creation began with this family. The new creation begins with one as well. And with that parallel in mind, keep in mind a few things here. Because like Adam and Eve, they lost the only home they had. They were forced to flee abruptly and without warning. 
And the overarching circumstances might be similar, but there's a critical difference here. Because both of them approach their problems really differently. Because Adam and Eve, what's the first thing Adam does when things look bleak? Adam blames his partner for his misery, right? The man said, this woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Okay, holy blame shifting Batman, right? Like, come on. But Joseph couldn't have been different, right? Because he could have said, hey, wait just a minute. I went along with all of this, yeah, name him Jesus, and you're pregnant from the Holy Spirit, but I am not leaving to go to Egypt. I am not leaving my home, everything I've known, fleeing in the middle of the night like a criminal because of what you did. Because Joseph could have viewed Mary as responsible and ultimately led in all of this, and, and he goes, it's your fault that Herod's trying to kill Jesus. But unlike Adam, Joseph doesn't point any fingers. He didn't protest. He didn't separate himself from Mary by suggesting their situation was her fault or somebody else's problem. And I go, in this marriage, we don't see them playing the blame game at all. So I go, that's a good example for us to follow. So why did Joseph take a different path than Adam? I think there might be a clue in the first description of Mary's future husband in Matthew 1.19. And um, in that word where it says that faithful to the law, in the Greek, that's, that is uh, transla translated, the, the Greek word is dikios, dikios. And a Greek word there that has various interpretations, and it can mean faithful to the law, but it kind of goes beyond that. It, it can mean righteous. And both those translations kind of illustrate a part of the meaning of, of the word, because it, it's, yes, it's following God's commandments, and it's being righteous with our God and with other people, but it also can mean fair and even and equal and well-balanced. One of the oldest word, uses of the word talks about like a chariot, and that this chariot is stable on all sides, can kind of go over rough terrain without falling over. And I think similarly, somebody who has this, that they might be seeing it good, good at putting things together with a situation that really matters and making a smart and fair decision. They have wisdom. And that idea of balance is really central to the word, and it helps us to see that why I think Joseph didn't blame Mary and why their marriage was a successful one, and maybe to navigate all the rocky terrain that they faced. When Adam blames Eve for all her, his problems, what happens? He's only expressing one side of the story, Right? And it's really easy to do that. You're like, well, they're the devil, obviously, right? They're the evil one. And we make ourselves look like the hero. And I go, don't do that. Because you don't, you got to take responsibility if you want to change. If there's something wrong in your life, take some responsibility for it. Then you can do something about it. If it's all somebody else's fault, you can do nothing about it. And you're always going to have to live with that garbage. And so don't do that. And I think with, with Joseph here, um, you know, or, or with Adam, he ignored the reality. He didn't protest. He didn't raise up any questions for her. Go, Eve gives him the fruit. He knew the command too. And by comparison, Joseph looks like a very different husband under pressure. Rather than leaving his wife to fend for herself in the midst of a disaster, Joseph worked with Mary. They worked together in obeying God's commands, protecting their family. They had each other, and they seemed to work well together. They raised Jesus for a time. How long, we don't know. And we don't have many details from the Bible about what happened to Mary and Joseph as a couple after Jesus grew to adulthood. We do get one clue from the Gospel of John when we see Jesus in agony on the cross. He specifically entrusted his mother to the care of one of the apostles. In John chapter 19, and verse 25, it says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciples whom he loved standing, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, "Woman, here is your son." And to the disciple, "Here is your mother." From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. See, if Joseph had still been alive, Jesus probably would not have appointed somebody else to take care of her because Joseph would have cared for her. And it would appear that at some point in this, Joseph had passed away um, before Jesus passes away here. 
And it's probable that Jesus died before his public ministry started, but and why? Because various points they talk about Mary being there and she's away from her husband and she probably would have spent time with her husband. But it's because it's unlikely that she would have left her husband alone. And I don't know what was the catalyst of that. Well, how did that start and when did that happen? We don't know. All we know is that in the end, Mary was alone again. And it's interesting to note, as some point out, that, that God entrusted a single mom with his greatest treasure, his son in the care of this single mother. And I've seen how just how resourceful and faithful and amazing single parents can be right here in the church. And thank you for the single parents that love your children and pointing them towards God and trying to figure all that out. And with that too, I think all married couples, ultimately most of us, the vast majority of married couples end up in this very situation separated from each other by death when one passes before the other. Mary was without a spouse, but she wasn't alone. She had God. She had the Holy Spirit. She had the church. And just as Mary and Joseph showed us how to walk in the path of pain and challenge and difficulty in their marriage, finding new ways to forge togetherness together, Mary also models strength in widowhood. Not only was she present in the most unimaginable horror of losing her son, but she continued to show up at the core of the early church. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we find her gathering the disciples together, it says, after the resurrection. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the the women, with the other women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. She wasn't alone. She wasn't home alone. She wasn't put out to pasture. She stayed faithful, and she walked with God. And we all have that same promise available to us that we can walk with God, that that he will never leave us. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, it says, Keep your lives from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And I go, That's the crux of the matter, right? That God will never leave us. We're not alone. We don't have to figure this out by ourselves. And it's what we celebrate as we take communion, that we celebrate this fact that Jesus came so that we could be connected to God, that we could be connected with him, that we have this remembrance each and every week that we're not alone. We don't have to figure this out. We don't have to try harder to be more like Jesus, that it's Jesus who makes us more like Jesus. And if you're feeling lonely, you're feeling separate, and you go, I I don't know, I'm not really connected with anybody, man, we'd love to help you walk closer to God. And get connected with the church. Come talk to me afterwards or talk to one of the other staff people. We'd love to to, to get connected with you or send us a message online. But let's pray for communion. Heavenly Father, God, I'm so thankful that you love us so deeply. That you give us so much. That, Father, you help us to remember that, that you say you'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us that we have this helper in you, this helper in Jesus, this helper in your Holy Spirit, that we don't have to figure it out, that we don't have to be afraid. And God, I just pray that you help us to embrace those things. God, help us not to live in isolation, even when we're surrounded by people. Help us, help us not give in to that loneliness and that depression and that anxiety, but help us draw closer to you, to be healed by you, to be changed by you, Holy Spirit. God, I'm so thankful for the gift of Jesus that you sent that baby to be cared for by a broken family just like us, by human people that you entrusted them, Father, and that you sent people to a walk, walk alongside with them. And God, I pray that you help us to see the people that you've sent into our lives, to walk alongside with us, to, to, to help us, to guide us, Father, as we take communion, help us to remember that incredible gift of Jesus, to be changed by him, and to live lives worthy of that calling we've received in Christ Jesus. It's in his name we pray.